What does being a great session player mean to you? Treat the song like it's your own. When you're in the mindset of treating the song as your own, do you mean from the perspective of caring about it in the same way that you would if you wrote it or taking creative ownership of it? Oh, oh, like I wrote it and I want it to be something. I try to play things that I would want to hear on somebody else's song. So, the, you know, I mean, noodly, noodly, noodly is cool, but it doesn't belong in most songs. So I try to play a part that people remember. Right. I try to push it a little bit mm-hmm. because I don't want it to be boring. Just when I hear it back, I don't want to suck. I don't want to think, that guy sucks <laughs> because it's me and I really don't like sucking. And wh- where did that, where did your I- introduction to music uh, start from when you were younger? I, you know, when I was a kid, I, I just, music was nothing to me. I mean, I heard it and it was nice and whatever, but I didn't, I didn't really pay attention to it. Then when I was 15, I was walking through my dad's living room, and he had Hee Haw on. You know, and I'm passing by, and it's Roy Clark sitting on a bale of hay playing a banjo, and all those girls were around him, and I'm 15, so, you uh-huh. know, hormones raging. And I saw that, and I thought, man, I need to play a banjo. Before that, it never occurred to me to play an instrument, nothing. So it took me about a month to talk my dad into it, got a banjo, had a record that was Earl Scruggs and a book that was an Earl Scruggs book. And I put that record on and I tried to play what he was saying. Man, it just two weeks and I, it looked like nothing was coming out. So I took it, put it back in the case, threw it under my bed. About six weeks later, a friend of mine comes over and we're horsing around and he says, hey man, pull that banjo out and play something. And I go, dude, I can't play anything on there. Oh, pull it out, I want to see it. You know? <laughs> and I pulled it out. And I'd been practicing this thing called Cripple Creek. I guess, I, I guess it's a song. I just it. I didn't really know bluegrass. I just wanted to play banjo. I picked it up and I started playing. And I guess I'd been thinking about it the whole time. And like it actually came out. And the hook was set. It's like, oh my gosh, look at me. What? Am, look, how did I do this? Wow. And it was like, that was to me... When I started, that was the magic of music is that you could learn how to do something and then you could actually do it, you know, because I couldn't I couldn't get anything out of it. And then it happened and mm-hmm. I was like, oh, and then I was hooked. It's really interesting how how, uh, how music can get so ingrained in our mind where we can work work on something and then it just it won't leave. It just gets stuck oh, yeah. in there and keeps rolling and how we can sort of visualize and problem solve mentally, but without even having an instrument. Yeah. Cause I didn't touch hands. it for like six weeks and then all of a sudden I pick it up and it pop, it came out. Is, is that, is that idea of, um, of visualizing or, or, or mentally kind of going through your process, something that has continued on in any way oh, in yeah. the studio world? Yeah. If I'm holding a chart and that's the work tape is playing, which is 99% of the time. I'm looking at the chart. I'm already planning my part Mm -hmm. or first part or whatever. And I mean, I've always done it. I've always been able to hear things going on in songs. I hear them and I have to, I think about doing them and I'm playing in the key, you know, of the chart, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm playing in my head along with the song. So I feel like I've, I'm cheating because I've already played through it once when we go out there for the first time. Yeah. Right. Well, that's why that first take is always, magic because yeah. you, you already got your practice taken well hopefully <laughs> <laughs> so when you were younger just listening to music were, were you kind of immediately drawn to the deeper details of it or did you just kind of listen to it just for enjoyment i listened to it my brothers and sisters you know they loved uh like Joni mitchell i'm 65 so it, i go back away so like they listen to Joni mitchell cat stevens folkier pop artists uh there's a little bit of Beatles in the house, but not a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's never really any rock. James Taylor, I loved. After I played the banjo for a year, I bought an acoustic guitar and I had a James Taylor book. And I learned his first two albums. You know, all the little Phil things he does and stuff. And I wanted to be James Taylor. I thought, man, this is it. I, lo- I love this. And I would play along to the record and then flip it over, play along to you. I had memorized them all. And then one day, uh, one of my cousins came over and he had gotten a, a real to real recorder, like a little small one. I don't even know what brand it was. And he recorded me and I heard it back and I was like, who's that singing? And he says, dude, that's you. And I said, oh, God, I suck. <laughs> so that's when I quit singing uh-huh. and I started practicing more. 
Uh-huh. Well, yeah. What about your guitar playing when you heard it back? Uh, you know, I thought it was pretty good, but, mm-hmm. I'd, uh, you know, hearing it now would probably make me cringe. And then uh, I started getting more serious about guitar, and some people asked me to join a band. And I thought, well, I have to get an electric guitar, you know. And then, I mean, I was so ill-prepared for my band experience. The only thing I had is that I didn't mind staying up all night learning something. I would just uh-huh. sit there and grind it because to me it was fun. So I didn't, I never really felt like practice was work. I mean, I've been on a few sessions where it's work, but that's usually from outside influences. Learning something or just getting it like I want it, that's always been easy. I would say that that, that, that concept is probably a good sign of whether or not someone should be following the path of a musician's career. Is oh, if, yeah. If pre- whether practice feels like work or not. Oh, yeah. And yeah, if, if you feel like music is work, I'd pick something else because it, it, it's hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, the amount of joy you get is great. The amount of work you put into it, it's pretty all-consuming if you want to be in the level of some cat that's going to play sessions. Right. So if you're not willing to – I mean, I've sacrificed a, a quite a bit. But I never felt like it was a sacrifice. Yeah, we hear that a lot. We're like, "Wow, that must be tough," and you know, and all that. And but I, when I when I hear people say those things, I just think like, "Well, I I love what I'm doing. There's no reason it is." But from an outside perspective, or if you start to feel like the focus on your your on perfecting your craft is a sacrifice in some way, then it's probably not the path that is going to make yeah, the most sense long term. For sure. Yeah. I mean, there's. There's work involved, and it never really stops. I mean, I still get up in the morning, practice, learn something, because I got songs coming at me all week. I got to do something that I don't want right. to kill myself over. Yeah. Would, does, does, for you, does that practice in the morning happen, like, right away, or do you do you have any sort of routine with, with that, like, where you get into your yeah. creative mindset? Well, you know, I, us- I have a couple of things that I do pretty much every day just to keep blah going, mm-hmm. you know, both hands. Uh that takes about 20 or 30 minutes and then i usually what is that that you do? uh it's just uh some patterns that i'll do i have a, like a set of patterns that i'll just run through it's just so i don't sink in level so i stay at the same <laughs> hopefully make some strides but mostly just to keep it and then uh then i'll either come up with a lick or something i'll find something to practice and like right now, I've been practicing. Um, I know this is so esoteric, but the movement of a five to a one minor in harmonic minor, and I've been practicing playing with chords the whole time. Which to me, I've always thought, oh gosh, that's so magical. People do that, and it just runs off. I'm like, and I can't. I could never do it. And I thought, oh well, I'll just practice that. For so for the last month and a half, literally, I'll get up, do my whatever 20 minutes of grunt work and then i'll practice that either to a track or you know i'll i'll make a little track or to a metronome or whatever so i don't feel so cold when i see one Mm -hmm. you know what i mean because i know if i practice these things they're gonna fall in my hands and then all of a sudden i'll be able to do it without thinking about it right because to me you know when you don't think about music that's where the magic happens so when you discover those those specific techniques that you're going to work on, does that happen through your process of playing on a session? or And then you discover something, oh, that was a little challenging. Oh, I yeah. probably need to oh, improve yeah. upon that, make a mental note, and then that's yeah. your focus for a little while? Yeah, for sure. If I run across something on a session that I really struggle with, I'll write it out, work on it, like, till I don't have to struggle on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I'll hear somebody else play something, I go, oh, gosh, that's cool. You know, I'll write it out. Yeah, this one was, uh, I was doing some Christmas song a bit ago, and they wanted an intro, and I said, hold on, I'm going to have to work one up. So I worked one up, and I thought, that took longer than it needed to. Because, you know, once you memorize it, boom, it, you don't have to know it. It's just done. I thought, man, I have some holes in my knowledge, and I, I need to fill those holes. So that's that's why I've been doing it. So when you jumped into that first band, would you say that the banjo, the acoustic guitar, or the electric guitar had more girls knocking on your door? 
Banjo's not going to have anybody knocking your do- on your door except saying, shut up! So our very first gig was supposed to be 9 to 1 at the Brobridge Crawfish Festival. And we played from 9 to 1, but the people were just getting started. We ended up playing from 9 to 5 in the morning. Wow. People kept coming up and giving us $100 bills. Yeah, so you keep playing, So at the right? end of the night, I had made like, it was my first gig with them. And I'd made like 250, 300 bucks, Mm -hmm. which in 1979 money or 70, I guess it was 78. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Right. And I was like, oh gosh, I'm going to buy so much gear. (laughs) That's the first (laughs) thing I thought of. So where did you learn about what what it is to be a session player? I bought a, I went to a music store to buy some strings and in this music store, they, they just put up a little thing on the counter for Guitar Player Magazine, and Larry Carlton was on the cover. And I had somebody had given me a record of his, and I'd listened to it a few, I just, you know, I mean, it's so far above my head. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. I'll never do that. Well, I look <laughs> over and I think, maybe he tells you how to do that. So I, I get the magazine, start reading it, and I read about how he was a session guy and what they did. And he, I don't, I'm guessing he said something about playing on movies and stuff. That part I, I kind of glossed over. Is, it was like he plays different songs every day. It's the only thing I could remember. Right. And I thought, man, that's amazing because we played the same songs. Every I night. mean, we'd rehearse every week and learn a couple songs, but we played dance music. So that's what we did, you know, that we would play the songs that they danced to. And if it was the same song three times in a row, we didn't care. That's what they wanted. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, man, that's what I got to do. There was an article about GIT, the guitar. Institute of Technology, (laughs) great name, in uh, Hollywood, and moved to Hollywood for a year and uh, went to GIT, and it was totally a mind-blowing thing. It's called Musicians Institute now for y'all that don't know, but I mean, it was being confronted with people who were so much better. And so while you were in school, were there any any mentors that you came across that that started to help you kind of get some experience in the scene a little bit? Tommy Tedesco who was like basically my favorite teacher because he was doing what I thought I wanted to do. So just playing sessions all the time. Mm-hmm. He took me on. His, I remember the first date he took me on as me and another guy. And the other guy didn't show up, which I'm thinking, dude, are you kidding? You don't show up to this. Right. And it's in a big scoring stage. It's for uh, Charlie's angels. So I'm on this date. And it's about, you know, I'm, it's amazing. I mean, horn players, string players, a stack of charts, like an inch and a half thick. And, you know, Tommy comes in. He's like, yeah, man, how's it going? Check this out. You know, so I'm watching him, and I've been practicing my reading a lot. I look over in the first chart, and I'm going, oh, I could do that. He flips over to the next one. They play some stuff, and it's just he hits a chord with a phaser on it. And I'm thinking... Oh, shoot, I could do that. <laughs> and then he says, hey, uh, I'm tacit on this next cue, so I'm going to go check my machine. Because back then, they would go, they had an answering service. So anyway, he leaves, and I think, ah. So I flipped over to the next chart, and it was just like, it was unreal. So many notes. It was like a million tadpoles had been released. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, I'm, I'm basically, I know I was turning white, because when he came back, he looked at me, he says, What's the matter with you? And I said, dude, like that, and uh, pointed at the chart. And and he said, like, n- supreme confidence. Of course, you know, Tommy was an amazing reader, but he points at it and he goes, well, what, what scares you about this? And the guy is getting ready to count the song off. So he's putting his, plug his guitar in and checking his tuning, and he's looking at it, and I'm going, <sighs> and it was all written and harmonic, which means they use sharps and flats, mixed them, it didn't have a key signature. Well, I'm looking, I'm just, I'm just, I can't believe it. it's two pages of death. <laughs> and and so, you know, he's he's looking at it, he says, I don't understand. And he goes, and he grabbed a pencil and he circled the first two staves. And he said, Could you play that? I said, Well, yeah, I could play this part. He says, Well then look. And he circled, circled, he had five circles on the two pages. And he says, It's the same lick. It's just in different keys. What scared you is sharps and flats mixed. He says, and here's the deal. 
I work for this guy all the time. I know how he thinks. He's going to do the same lick, and he's going to repeat it in different keys. He says, I don't know why he uses his copyist, but they never want to use key signatures. He says, so these are things I know. When I can sit down, I look at that, and, you know, I, you know, he was saying, I'm a great reader, but he is. But also, he knew enough not to be freaked out. Right. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And that was probably one of my three most valuable things right. I've ever learned about being in a session is don't get freaked out. So what introduced you to the Nashville industry? Well, what happened is I was going to move back, play in a band, the, in the band I was with, uh, save money, and move to Nashville. And about a month after I moved back, my oldest brother was signed to Motown. I think he was the first single artist signed to Motown that wasn't. He was he he was like a folk white folk singer, which you know, but they signed him. <clears throat> Excuse me, and he uh, he had he had walked away from it. He didn't want to cut the songs they had for him, which you know. But he wrote songs, and he had five songs he wanted to demo, which is, I guess everybody knows what the demo is. Right. Okay, great. Uh, and he said, well, I'm going to bring you with me, and we're going to cut and Muscle Shoals. And I go, whoa, okay. So I was familiar with what Muscle Shoals was, but not I'd never been there. And I show up, and <clears throat> I, we, we show up a few days early because, you know, Kicker knew all the people that lived in Muscle Shoals, or a lot of them. It's a pretty small community. And back then it was pretty small too. Um, so that there was a thing called Demo Day. Uh, it was at Broadway Studio. And, you know, there's a bunch of guys. And Kicker knew the bass player's name was Bob Wright, who's a famous session bass player. Mm -hmm. And so we show up and I'm just hanging out. I'm just a kid. And uh, and I think, it, I think Ken Bell was on the session, who's another famous session guitarist. Yeah. Uh, and Ken had to go somewhere and they had a song and kicker said, well, John can play it. <laughs> what did said, you say? Well, I, I, I mean, I was really shy. I was, I wasn't going to say, and I said, what? And he says, yeah, get out there and just play. He says, and the engineer was, his name was David Johnson, who I, over the years, I, you know, I worked for him a million times, but back then I didn't know him, but he was really nice. He says, dude, just get out there, play whatever you want. Anything that sucks, I'll turn it off. And I went, uh, okay. I had no approach to a song. I didn't know how to approach a song, but I did know how to play a bunch of licks because I'd just come out of school. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I had, I had lick. <laughs> I was very lick happy. Uh -huh. Anyway, so I used Ken left one of his guitars, as a, one of his acoustics, and I went out there and I just basically play, played Phil through this whole song and they had a number chart. I can't remember who was who wrote the number chart, but I looked at it and it looked kind of Greek to me. I wasn't that familiar with it, but I could hear the song wasn't that hard, so I could follow it by ear. And I played, and I must have played something somebody liked because everybody was shaking my hand at the end of it, or they were just glad I was leaving. I <laughs> still haven't figured that part out. And anyway, so uh, then we did a session for Kicker, and. The guy who owned the studio, his name's Clayton Ivey, he's a really well-known keyboard session guy and also producer and stuff. And mm -hmm. I call him dad, if that gives you any idea. I didn't call him dad then. Uh -huh. And then so we did the five songs. So at the end, he calls me into his office. He says, hey, you need to move here. I said, well, you know, I'm saving up my money to move to Nashville. And he says, nah, you're not ready. He says, you move here, I'll teach you how to do sessions. He said, and I'll use you on everything I do. And I went, ooh, well, that's nice. So I moved the next week. I quit the band. Uh -huh. They were so mad. <laughs> I, 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 I moved up, and he did. He, he used me on everything he did. And we would, if he didn't have anything, you know, one night he would call 2 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, man, let's cut an instrumental. I want to hear you play some." So we'd get up and we'd go and we'd cut a track and then I'd just play solos for an hour, which is <laughs> what I really liked. And and we, you know, obviously I call him dad, so that's how close we were. And uh he 
he talked me around town. He got me on some record dates, but there was so much I didn't know and so much valuable information that I learned in a short period of time because people, I guess because I was like 20, I guess I was 22, since I was such a kid, they would just say stuff to me. And one, I remember one of the most important things uh, was a, this guy, he's a really well-known songwriter, but he also, he played bass, played sessions on the bass. His name's Gary Baker. And we're on a session and I'm playing and he says, hey. And I move my headphone off and he goes, who do you listen to? And I said, Crusaders, and Larry Carlton and blah, blah, blah. He said, yeah, this ain't a, a Crusader song. He said, the Crusaders sell 10,000 records. He said, we need something for the people who buy a million or two million records. That's the kind of thing we need. And it shocked me because I thought I was killing it. But what I was just doing was just ruining the song because I didn't have a concise part. I didn't have anything that helped the vocal. All these things. And I went, oh, shoot. So I turned the radio on and the record player off. And all I did was listen to Top 40 for years. I mean, night and day, I would listen. I would go, oh, I love that part. I need to, you know. And mm -hmm. then Clayton said the same thing. He said, man, he said, listen to Reggie Young. He's the most tasteful person in the world. You just need to learn, steal all of Reggie's licks and just learn how to do that. He says, you need how to make the song the most important part of playing. And wow, I mean, it changed my life. So you cut your teeth in Muscle Shoals mm -hmm. and then when did, when did you graduate into the Nashville community? Well, it's funny because it was a very similar thing to what happened with Clayton Ivy in Muscle Shoals is what happened here. Uh, Alabama was cutting and of the eight songs they had picked, I'd played on the demos of six of them. And uh, Randy, Owen, this is the story I heard. I'm, I'm assuming it's close to true. Said, who's playing guitar on that? And well, whoever said, uh, well, we'll find out. And, oh, that's John Willis. He's from Muscle Shows. And I'd played, I'd worked for Teddy already doing demos at his house in Fort Payne because several writers from Muscle Shoals would write with Teddy Gentry and I would go. So Teddy knew some of them, three of them, we had cut at his house. So uh, he says, oh, that's John. He says, well, why don't we just get John? So at that time, Alabama was the biggest act in country music. I was still living in Muscle Shoals and I was driving up to Nashville because half of my friends had moved up here and a lot of songwriters that I knew moved up here. I, I was doing work for Rob Galbraith, who worked for Ronnie Millsap. So I had done some Millsap sessions, and I'd done several things. But I played on Shenandoah's Cut and Muscle Shows, and they were big, too. But Alabama was like the top of the heap back then. And uh, I got called for those Alabama sessions. The leader on the session was David Briggs. You know, we, we start cutting the first song, and I'm pretty sure the first song we cut was Touch Me When We're Dancing, which ended up being a big single for him. So, you know, I, I do the intro I, do, I come up with some intro lick and then the first verse, you know, I'm playing electric. So I just wait till something hits me and then, you know, whatever. Well, at lunchtime that day, David comes up to me and says, Hey, why don't you live in Nashville? And I go, well, you know, I got some accounts here, but I don't have a whole, I don't have a whole lot. I work in Atlanta a lot and blah, blah, blah. And he says, look, you need to move here. I said, Oh, 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 well, he says, if you move here, I'll use you on everything I do and I'll talk about you all over town. It was almost exactly what Clayton <laughs> said. I mean, it uh -huh. was it was creepy how close it was. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine who was one of the engineers at Music Mill, his name's Jim Cotton, was standing there getting coffee while David's giving me the speech. And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, man, I'll think about it. Well, as soon as David walks off, Jim Cotton comes over and he says, dude, you know who that is? And I go, yeah, it's a keyboard player. And he goes, no, that's David Briggs. Everybody listens to David Briggs. He says, you got to move. He says, I've been wanting you to move for like a year now. He says, just move. And I go, hmm. And over the course of the three days of sessions, David would, you know, he was, he says, I love the way you lay out. You know, he would say, he would make little comments, and he said, dude, you got to move here. I said, well, 
okay. The second week, I got called for three days with Alabama, and he said it again. He says, he said, and I said, dude, I'll be here next week, and I moved <laughs> the next week, <laughs> and it was a fortuitous circumstance that he was true to his word. He used me on everything. He stuck me on stuff. Like he had some dates that were already booked that had guys on them that didn't even need like an acoustic guitar or another electric. And he would just make me do them. He would say, come on, sign a card. I mean, it was unreal how, you know, and he said the reason he wanted me to move, not, you know, he knew I could play is that uh, he liked the way I didn't play. Like I had taste because he said it's gotten to the point where everybody feels everywhere and it's, it's very frustrating because they have to go in and take people out. He says, you play for the song. And I said, well, yeah, doesn't everybody. And the day before I moved, I was in Atlanta working a session. It was a two-day thing, and the keyboard player, his name was Larry Goss. Well, he's playing keys. I don't know Larry from everybody. But we're joking around and playing stuff, you know, and I'm, you know, we're goofing off. And at the end of it, he says, hey, why don't you move to Nashville? I said, well, it's funny you saying that. I'm moving tomorrow. And he <laughs> says, well, here, here's my number. Call me when you get settled. Well, you know, I'm thinking, oh, nice. I know another keyboard player. Great. Okay, so I'm, I move. You know, back then you'd have a phone put in. You had to get it connected. You right, could, yeah. No cell phones. Right. And so I get my phone connected, and I call Larry's number and leave a message on the answer machine. And, hey, Larry, it's John. I'm, I'm in town. Here's my number, blah, blah, blah. Well, he calls me back about two hours later and proceeds to book me on 18 days of sessions over the next three months. I mean, wow. literally, my hand was shaking with the pencil because back then you used a book and you would write it in. Yeah. And my hand's shaking. I, could, I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, Larry, who are you? And he says, well, you know, I produce some Southern gospel music. I didn't know. He was like the biggest producer of Southern gospel and gospel music in the world. I had no idea. And he wow. had done that those sessions for this lady named Babby Mason just because he liked her, not because he ever needed to do a session. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it was just circumstance, luck, timing, and being uh, qualified to do the gig. So over the next two years, I worked for Larry, probably played on half of the gospel session, uh, like gospel families. I didn't know anything about gospel music. So I'd pull out a talk box. I'd play fuzz. I'd, you know, I was back then, I'd put fifths on it and play like yes. I didn't know there were <laughs> rules, uh <-huh. laughs> obviously. And I got called down a few times, but he liked the fact that I would just go for it because I heard what was on the radio. That's what I wanted to play. So he would use me. And because Larry used me, it qualified all these other people to start calling me for dates. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I had a fair amount of work. Living in Muscle Shoals, you know, I had some dates in Huntsville, I do Atlanta, and I would do some stuff in Nashville. But when I moved to Nashville, between what David Briggs did, and because David Briggs called me, then all these other session leaders would call me because Briggs was using me. Mm -hmm. And uh, because Larry Goss was calling me, all these other gospel producers would call me because, hey, they want to use who Larry's using. Mm -hmm. so i hit the ground running and then the alabama single came out um two months after i'm in town and it goes straight to like you know whatever number one or something but everybody would look to see who's playing on alabama because that's who they wanted to call right and i started getting all these calls i mean wow. it, it it was just fortuitous circumstances but being ready for them mm -hmm. i mean it, it was great for me you know not everybody gets that, but it it was nice. Right. Know? Well, there there's a couple things that you did that allowed that opportunity to happen. I mean, the first one is obviously the preparation, which you mentioned. You yeah. put in the work to do that, and you wanted to, and you enjoyed that work, yeah. which which made you excited when someone maybe gave you a suggestion about what you should work on. Yeah. It wasn't the you don't take it any offense to it. You don't. You're not right. like, oh man, it's something else. I got to go practice. You're like, cool. That's awesome. I got a new thing that I can learn and get better at. Mm -hmm. But then when an opportunity was presented, there was. It seems to be seemingly like no question. You were like, consider it. Okay, this sounds like a, a reasonably good gamble to take. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Yeah. 
there wasn't a, well, I need it for it. Now tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like there wasn't a, well, I need to check with this thing and make sure that I have this, this secure and this balance that just, it sounds like your response to that was just like, great opportunity. Do what yeah. I love. Yes. I'm moving. Boom. Let's do it. Yeah. Right. Now that happened two times, which you can say is, is luck and good timing and that sort of thing. Maybe so, but there's gotta be something that you presented within those sessions that led both of those individuals to be so persistent in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. If you were to think about it from an outside perspective, like an observer in that situation, is there anything that you think you could pinpoint that would, that would maybe lead, lead someone towards saying, not just saying like, Hey, you know, you should think about moving here, but like you have to move here. And if you do, I'm going to put you on. Why, why would they say I, I'm going to put you on sessions as opposed to just making the suggestion? I, you know, they saw something in me. I, I, you know, I, I've done a lot of sessions. Like, I learned early on, never say no. I mean, because it doesn't, you could be in some, oh, my kid ain't listening to this, but some little shithole, and we're cutting songs that you think nobody's going to hear, but somebody hears it. Right. And they go, who's that guitar player? And then they would call. Mm-hmm. You know, and it may lead to something. I mean, obviously, I played on six of the eight songs for Alabama on the demos. Mm -hmm. You know, if I said, oh, I don't want to play on demos, you know, well, that's stupid. Why would you not? If you're not working, do whatever. You know, uh, there's there's that. There was the hunger to learn new stuff. And I've always been one to try out new sounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had several times where people have, balled up charts and throwing them at me because they thought it was a keyboard part because I'll do some wacky. This was back when wacky wasn't that popular, <laughs> but I thought, you know, this will be cool. I'll try it. Whatever. I'm going to try it. I've always been one that I don't like to play the melody of the song in the intro lick. I don't think it's, I mean, I know there's people who made a career out of it and I know it's important, whatever. But to me, my statement over the chords can be as hooky as anything and it's the first thing they hear and so that's something i'm pretty good at so i'll do that mm -hmm. and reggie young told me he says you know if you're playing fills and you can't sing the song while you're playing them you're playing too much which is probably the most valuable information on playing fills that's ever been said i mean because reggie young is the king of fills or was the king, God rest his soul. Uh, he just, he said that to me and it just landed in my brain with a branding iron. And I thought, man, that's how you do it. I said, sing while you're playing, sing the song. And I can't sing and play something different. So I have to wait. And it's just the developing taste, developing a repertoire of sounds and approaches that you can take on songs knowing the artist and the producer because as you learn what they like and what they don't like i mean on a chesney session i would never pick up a slide why would you ever do that he absolutely hates slide don't do it mm -hmm. even if the song calls for it it's 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 not going to get past him and he's just going to be aggravated by it so don't do it uh you know, learning how to play acoustic guitar without making squeaks is a lifelong battle. Right. Any tips uh, on that? Lifting those fingers just a little bit higher than you think you need to when you're moving up or down mm -hmm. is nice. Or pressing down and don't let go. Play with a thin pick when you're playing acoustic because it get, it makes your acoustic more EQ'd high end. So the engineer doesn't reach for the high end and goose it and then raise up all your squeaks and noise and stuff that that one i learned early on because i used to squeak like a it, it sounded like an old mad duck it was so bad <laughs> uh but i had people who were patient enough to think and you know early on i i played sessions with mac mac and Allie. i just go up to him and say dude how do you do it he says well you know sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but here's what i do he says i do this like i rub my fingers across my forehead right before we start and I'll rub the strings. He says that little bit of oil sometimes can be the difference between you having a punch or not. Wow. You know, I, I mean, there were several, I played with several amazing 
acoustic players, they all seem to have something, some tricks, you know. Um, the thin pick thing was a, a mind blower for me because I never thought about it. That was a Mac thing, too. He says, man, if you play with a thin pick, he says, check this out. I mean, he just sat there basically and gave me free instructions <laughs> because I didn't really know how to play acoustic other than yeah. James Taylor stuff. I didn't know strumming. You know, I had guys that were patient enough to go, no, dude, up and down, up and down. Don't stop. Don't accent. Do this. That's what country music is. I said, man, that's hard, though. Like the Forrester Sisters, their first album, it was me and Will McFarlane sitting across from each other playing acoustics. And Jerry Wallace, who is co-producing the album, came up and said, guys, no. He takes the guitar from me and he does this, strumming down and up, down and up, even as could be, no fan, nothing fancy. Just He says, that's what I need. He says, you got to give it to me. He says, this is going to make the song strong. And he was right. I mean, it does, It works. I mean, now you don't hear that as much now because there's not so much hardcore country. But back then, half the songs had that. I mean, I would say hearing, um, what's that Randy Travis song? On the other hand, and hearing that acoustic guitar in that first verse was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. because you hear it and it's so simple it's just vanga vanga whatever but it's so right for the song and serving the song is the first rule of being a session guy so as 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 those great opportunities started to come your way and and in your career starting to progress and you and with your mindset of kind of wanting to throw some wacky ideas out there at times mm -hmm. and um, was there ever a, a, a situation where you went a little bit too far with that idea and got a little too comfortable and had to rain back where you got a good oh, lesson gosh, on every day? What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, back then when I was I was mostly playing electric, and I mean it, it's the curse of playing electric guitar because everybody wants you to do a certain thing. They call you because you're crazy. Like that's what I got called for the crazy stuff, and. Uh, I mean, one day we're cutting J.D. Sumner and the Stamps. Now, come on, you can't get more gospel than that. And I said, dude, let me play, let me do the yes solo on this. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, just roll it. Let me put, you know, the fifths. You know, I had one of those Ibanez splitter things, and, and I play a solo, and I thought, man, this is cool. And half of the dudes dug it, and J.D. Sumner standing there, and I hear the producer's name was michael sykes and he presses a button and as he's pressing it i hear jd in the back going what's that devil guitar doing on there we can't have that on my music so obviously i went too far i said oh well you know i just, you know i was just trying it so then i just did whatever a regular right. guitar solo but if i hadn't gone for it if i'd have just gone for the regular guitar solo you know Maybe they wouldn't have called me back because half of those guys were like crazy about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds so different than every other thing I hear and read. So, you know, but that becomes a curse in itself because then everybody expects you to do what you do. And then if you're playing a lot and you're playing on a lot of records, then all of a sudden what you do gets overexposed and then nobody wants to hear. It. Is is there a is there a way that you've nav that you navigated that and in, in the way to well I, to be known enough for something but not too much that it becomes a curse? No, nah, I mean I got I got pretty overexposed, I gotta say, because it was my deal, but whatever. Uh so then I started getting called for acoustic dates because I play acoustic like I play electric. It's parts to me. Mm -hmm. You know, unless it's an old country song and then I'll do whatever. So I started getting called for all these acoustic dates and people started calling me and saying, are you the acoustic player and blah, blah, blah. And I go, yeah. And he go, I, I, you know, and then I started getting booked for that. So I started, you know, I've always done overdubs. I had a, a Kai 12 track. People would send me tapes back. I mean, shoot. I, I just remember, I've always had a room where I could do overdubs. So I've always played both. I mean, in Muscle Shoals, you had to play both because most of the time you were the only guitar player. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to do both. Uh, and then, you know, as I started getting known as an acoustic player, you know, I started getting a bunch of calls for it. And it's, you know, I, lo I love it because you can be creative and still not like bang your head against the wall because, you know, 
people will work electric players way harder. Yeah. And and I, I've seen it a lot of times. People get real frustrated by it. And you, it's one of those things that can wear you down. Yeah. In Nashville, though, it does require needing to be, be comfortable on a lot of different instruments. Yeah. Um, how do, Was there any practice other than that other than you know thinking that banjo was the was the girl magnet in the first place and well you know it's, there. it's funny because when i started playing banjo again i i couldn't finger pick anymore with finger picks mm -hmm. so when i started playing again i bought a six string banjo because i thought oh this is cool it can be funky yeah. i'm horrible on the banjo i mean <laughs> i play with a flat pick i don't know any tricks you know what i mean i mean i play like it's like a guitar almost mm -hmm. but you know people wanted that for a bit and right. uh, it worked out pretty good but you know i played some dobro not in my lap but up mm -hmm. i play mandolin but i tune it like a guitar so it's, it's very sinful i mean i've got a ton of junk at the house i mm -hmm. i would guess 70 percent of my work is at my house over to people either bring me sessions mm -hmm. to play on or send them through the internet and I produce right. at from the house. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty important skill to have. Yeah, totally. And that, um, like, it sounds like you started that really early where it still wasn't as common. So what led you to, to get into that? Did you see like an opportunity for it? Was it something you just enjoyed doing? Well, I love, I, lo I do love producing. The only part about producing I don't like is the schmooze factor because I'm not very good at it. But the part about taking a track from nothing and making it into a song and then people going, I would have never thought of that, but that is great. That to me makes my heart happy. And so, um, so these days where you're saying like, so like in, in the current state, like maybe mm -hmm. six, 60, 70% of your work is in the remote side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what sort of things would, so someone's trying to get into that these days and they're looking at the online marketplace for opportunities to collaborate online with, with artists, with, with different artists or, or different songwriters and clients mm -hmm. and stuff. What sort of things were important going into developing like a working home studio? It's one of those things where you have to decide what you want to do. If you just want to overdub for other people, that's great. Just set up your rigs, learn how to play acoustic without making noise, learn how to play electric without buzzing you got to reach out to songwriters. I mean, when I started literally in Muscle Shoals, it was 10 bucks a song, no matter how long it took. Crazy, but that's just how it was. And then I, experience is your friend. The more you do, the better you get at it. And I got to say, every time you do a song, you learn something. It could be something good. It could be something bad. But you have to get the experience of recording songs and coming up with parts. Well, I think our listeners are going to learn so much from this. I'm inspired. Oh, I'm well, amped cool. up, man. I got goosebumps. Right. I'm like, let's let's get to work. <laughs> well, wait till you hear the God particle. <laughs> Have you heard it? The plug-in? The God particle? Uh, I keep seeing it, but I haven't, oh my I haven't used it yet. So you're telling me that I need, to, I need to get it? Between that and track spacer is the two things that have changed my life. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, thank you for joining us. Oh, we well, we appreciate you. it, man. All right. Well, shoot. It was a pleasure.